an all-new Dr. Phil. She had it all. I was rich and gorgeous. Now I'm just broke and fat. A wife and a mother. You've abandoned these children. I want to be a good mom. You don't deserve them. From living the dream. You get so drunk you're asleep on the lawn. You drank in rehab. To living with their parents. I have to hide the bottles. The disease lies. I don't. Let's do it. Is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Steve say they fell madly in love when they met over 15 years ago. So they decided to marry and have a family. Steve, an attorney and a Wall Street executive, was making over a half million dollars a year, while Carrie, well, she was a pampered stay-at-home mom taking care of their children in their beautiful four-bedroom home in Westchester, New York. But eight years ago, after Carrie turned 40, things took a turn for the worse. Carrie says she started to feel bored with her life of nannies, housekeepers, and constant pedicures. Now, Steve claims Carrie started drinking and neglecting the children because she was too hungover to parent. Now, they eventually separated, and a jobless Carrie moved in with her parents. Now, Carrie says she's angry because Steve, who once made the big bucks as a big-time Wall Street attorney, traded it all in to open a marijuana dispensary business and is no longer able to support her in the way she had grown accustomed. Take a look at Carrie's self-described downward spiral that took her from rich, fit, and tan to what she calls, in her words, broke and fat. My husband Steve and I had it all. My wife Carrie seemed to have everything she wanted. We had two beautiful children who went to the best private schools. We lived in a nice 3,000 square foot home with four bedrooms in an exclusive community just outside New York City. We actually lived in the same town as Martha Stewart. We had nannies, housekeepers, and gardeners. I drove a Porsche. We had Denali's, BMWs. For vacations, we would go to Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, Mexico, Aruba. I would spend my days going shopping. For my 40th birthday party, I bought a Cavalli gown. I wore Labutans, Manolo Blahniks, Valentino. Steve was a successful corporate lawyer. He made nearly $700,000 a year. About four years ago, Steve quit his job. My first reaction was, oh my God. Now I own and manage a legal cannabis business. My feeling is that he's basically dealing drugs. To say the least, everything we had just went away. The nannies, the cars, poof, gone. Last year, we decided to separate. In my past, I've had some issues with drinking. I've been in and out of rehab for alcohol use. I was so upset, I was just drinking our problems away. Harry checked out of her desire to be a mother. Now our children live with Steve. I feel like my life has completely fallen apart. I don't have a job. I really need Steve to help me out financially. But Steve absolutely refuses. He basically cut me off. He can't do that, I'm his wife. I need to minimize the drama in our lives at this point. I hope that she can figure this out. I needed a place to live, so I had to move back in with my parents. I don't even recognize myself. I put on at least 150 pounds, and I was rich and gorgeous. Now I'm just broke and fat. I'm a complete riches to rag story, and I don't know what to do. Well, that sounds pretty bleak in your view. Yeah, it is. Yeah? Yeah. So... How'd this all come unraveled for you? What, uh, what happened? Well, like you said, when I turned 40, something kind of snapped and I went into a deep depression. And our relationship kind of started falling apart. And uh, when Steve left his job, things really changed. 
in terms of lifestyle. It and was. that seems like it was pretty important to you. Uh, I don't want to seem entitled, but it was what I became accustomed to. Yeah. And when you say you became accustomed to it, you expected it. You were disappointed when it went away. Yes, I was. You're describing every brand of of uh, gown you're wearing, shoes you're we I can't even pronounce half of <laughs> the Just stuff. Just call them red bottoms. Yeah. Where's all that stuff? Uh, it's in boxes somewhere. It's all size two, and I'm hanging on to it in the hopes that I'll get back there one day. And you used to have a problem with drinking. Right. But you don't now. Um, that's uh, questionable. <laughs> It's not really questionable, is it? No, I do. You have a serious problem with drinking, right? Right. How many times have you been to rehab? At least six. Six times to rehab. And what do you do when you get out? <coughs> I go to AA meetings and I'll stay sober for a while, but eventually I relapse and go back to drinking. Like this picture your husband took? Oh, yeah. How long have you been out of rehab here? the same weekend that I got out. The weekend you get out? Yeah. You get so drunk you're asleep on the, on the lawn? Yeah. So look at this picture. That's Armani. <laughs> I wasn't asking about the dress. <laughs> I was asking about the woman in the dress. Yeah, I was, that was a happy time. You weren't sober then? I'm not sure, probably not. Where was your husband when all this unraveling was going on? He was actually busy helping take care of the kids. He um, did most of the cooking, most of the grocery shopping. Um, he was there for us. But now you're dogging on him saying he's basically a drug dealer. Right. How's he doing on raising the children? Well. And their mother is where? Two hours away at her parents' house. I want to be there for my children and be a good mom for my kids. You go to rehab and drink while you're there? I have. So what's more important to you than being with your children? I guess my relapses have gotten in the way of that. <clears throat> Well, excuse me for being a bit barbaric, but I want you to pull your head out of your ass and get in the game here. You're, you're better than what you're doing. You are better than what you're doing. You're better than laying around. Where are you going to be a year from now doing what you're doing? I'm tired of feeling hopeless. It's not where I want to be. You say that Steve must still have money, and you say his favorite excuse is, I don't have money because I'm spending money on your medical expenses. He says he spent, what, close to half a million dollars on your rehab. That's not even true. Well, what would you do if he started giving you money right now? Honestly, what would you do with it? I would move to the town where my children are, work full time, buy a car. You drank in rehab. Yeah. You're to be trusted with money now. Is that what you're saying? Everything would be fine. It's a possibility. Somebody stamp stupid on my forehead? <laughs> you don't believe that. The way things are right now, it's out of control. Right. I understand that, and I don't want that. Well, tell yourself the truth. The disease lies. I don't. I'm curious what your husband has to say. We're going to add him to this conversation next and see how all of this unfolded and went from the fancy gowns and the red bottom shoes to living two hours away from the kids who have got to be wondering, where is my mother? We'll be right back. Things started to change when we moved to just outside of New York City. 
seemed like life was one big party to her. Carrie was unable to function as a mother. Carrie's probably been in and out of rehab between 10 and 15 times. The amount I've spent on her is in the range of $500,000. And later... I know you think you've been there, but Carrie just haven't been there in years. The truth of the matter is, you've abandoned these children. You don't deserve them. an all-new Dr. Phil. I am facing jail time because I refuse to let my children see their father. She claims she's protecting her kids. It is odd that you would ask me to move back in if I'm so abusive. No, I ask you just to see what you would say. So you were baiting him? He claims she's coaching them. I'm not coaching. They were kind under the stairs. Well, I googled your house and there aren't any steps to hide under. Those kids have been coached. That's Monday. To say the least, Steve has a lot of anger issues. Steve flies into a rage and he literally foams at the mouth. In the past, he has put his hands on me, bruised me by pushing me or grabbing me. He's even choked me and ripped my hair out. In a fit of rage, he even threatened to kill me. There were a lot of years where I felt angry and now I just feel sad. He feels I've ruined his and our children's lives. Well, Carrie says when she first met her husband, Steve, she saw him as her knight in shining armor and was swept away by their lifestyle of lavish vacations, fancy shopping sprees, fine dining, all funded by his six-figure paycheck. But that all came to a halt when Steve traded in his high-paying Wall Street job to be a small businessman selling marijuana. Legally, it's licensed in the state. Steve says he chose his new line of work as it enabled him to be more involved in their children's lives. Take a look. Things started to change when we moved to just outside of New York City. Carrie felt like she needed to keep up with the Joneses. It seemed like life was one big party to her. Her life spiraled out of control. We had two young children. Carrie was so focused on drinking, I had to step up to make sure our children were taken care of. She could no longer handle the responsibilities. The reason I changed my career was so I could focus on our children and be a stay-at-home dad because Carrie was no longer available. She was unable to function as a mother. Although Carrie was there physically, she seemed to have abandoned the family and the children mentally for many years. We have certainly seen Carrie falling apart. She seems like a shell of herself. Carrie's probably been in and out of rehab between 10 and 15 times. The amount I've spent on her health care in the last 10 years, I would say it's in the range of $500,000. Carrie has treated rehab as somewhat of a vacation. She will come back home and go right back to drinking. I'm no longer able to live with Carrie because I need to focus on the children. The money that we have left needs to go to raising our children. Steve, it's good to meet you. I'm glad you're here. Um, Thank you. Did you fold your career to be a stay-at-home dad? Oh. To, to take the place of, uh, of an absent parent? I transitioned my career so right. that I could focus on the children. Has that worked for you? It's working. I mean, and I, how are I, the I, children? I wish that it wasn't my first choice. The children are doing remarkably well. Uh -huh. I, I think they miss their mother and you know, would like to have a happy, healthy mother back in their life. But she's not in their lives now, right? And not making an effort? Not in a, it's not in a significant way. You, you bailed on your daughter's class party in kindergarten. Uh, he says, you haven't shown up to school events in years. Uh, you stayed in bed for months. You've been drunk in front of the children. He's been in charge of meals, homework, errands. And in the meantime, you've been going to rehab 10 times. You say six. He says 10 or more. Your daughter is how old? 13. She wrote a letter to you. She says, Dear Mom, I understand that drinking makes you happy and calm, but you don't see that I interpret that as not my mom. I have never thought of drunk you as my mom. I have thought of drunk you as an evil twin. Mom, I know you're capable of taking a difficult situation and making it better. Sobriety 
happiness, connection. That's all I want. And she signs it, love the daughter who will never, ever leave you or betray you. It's so painful. When you told us your story, you talked about a lavish lifestyle. You talked about a four-bedroom home that was gone. You talked about private schools that were gone. You talked about nannies that were gone. You talked about expensive vacations, driving expensive cars. You talked about the Cavalli gowns, the shoes I can't pronounce. You <laughs> talked about all of those things that were gone. But you didn't say much, if anything, about the quality time with your children. It's too painful. It's part of the reason I drink is because it's all so painful. Carrie says her parents allowed her to move back home with one condition. She does not abuse alcohol. Said if she drinks, deal off. So did she keep her end of the agreement? Well, we'll talk to them and find out what they say when we come back. My husband and I are very frustrated with Carrie. All she wants to do all day is just lay on her bed and watch TV. My fear is that our daughter is never going to leave. She tells me she hasn't been drinking. We've told her if we catch her drinking, we're taking her to the homeless shelter. And later... These kids are suffering. Don't say I've been a great parent. And my brother, God love him. He's been there for them. And you haven't. moment I'm living with my parents. I'm 48 years old and I feel like I'm locked up. It feels like living in jail. It's very tense living with my parents. They're on my case about getting a job, getting a car, getting out of the house. I feel like a teenager. They absolutely treat me like a child. Carrie says she feels like a teenager since being forced to move home with her mom and her dad. Her parents, Charlie and Carolyn say they have made huge sacrifices to allow their jobless 48-year-old daughter to stay with them, including loaning her thousands of dollars. Now, their only stipulation is that Carrie not drink while she lives under their roof. About four months ago, our daughter Carrie moved in to our home. When I picked her up at the airport, I didn't recognize her. She'd gained so much weight. My husband and I, at this point, are very frustrated with Carrie. All she wants to do all day is just lay on her bed and watch TV. Carrie doesn't have a job, and she hasn't been looking for a job. I've tried to give her advice. She acts like she doesn't appreciate it, so I pretty much given up. We've given her about $12,000. We told her if we give you money, it's going to come out of your inheritance. She tells me she hasn't been drinking. We've been very clear with her. We've told her if we catch her drinking, we're taking her to the homeless shelter. We've told her flat out that if we catch her drinking, it's a deal breaker. My fear is that she will never get her act together. Thank you all for being here. Now, her behavior, according to you guys, I made a list. You, you say even living under your roof, she doesn't clean. She doesn't help cook dinner. You say she watches TV 95% of the time. You say she sits in her room, doesn't have a job. You gave her $2,000 for class that she didn't take. She pawned her wedding ring for money, sold the car, received $300, took $12,000 from y'all, serious debt. We want to try to give her the benefit of the doubt. You gave her $12,000? Well, well, over a period of time. We're considering it early inheritance. So when the time comes, if there's anything left to share with her sister, it will come out of her share. You, you give a drunk cash. Oh. oh, we didn't. Yeah, we did. Did we give her cash? <laughs> well, you did lay this rule down. If you're not going to drink here, 
You might lay around like a lizard on a rock and watch TV all day, but you're not going to drink here. <laughs> now, despite her parents claiming she doesn't drink, Carrie confessed something to us on tape just a few days ago. Take a look. There's a lot that my parents and Steve don't even know. They all think that I've been sober. The fact of the matter is, is that I have been drinking. Just yesterday, I probably had 10 drinks. Even today, I had two tequilas and a bottle of wine. In my parents' house, I know they have a no drinking rule. But you know, I drink at their home all the time. I use my parents' car to go buy alcohol. I have this great Todd's purse that I can hide the liquor in. Sometimes I have to drape a sweater over it so they can't see that it's bulging. And what I do is I close the bedroom door and go in and I drink. When I'm drinking, I have to hide the bottle behind pillows. After I finish a beer at my parents' house, I'll take the bottle and hide it in a suitcase I have in my closet. This is where I'm hiding my bottles. If my parents find it, they're gonna take them out. I also have two adult children from a previous relationship. And they pick me up, we go out drinking. Cheers, bottoms up, Long Island iced tea. My fear now is that everyone knows what I've been up to. My parents are probably gonna kick me out. What's your reaction to that? We had our suspicions. Yeah, but... but we didn't have proof. And you don't really want to be the alcohol police. When you have a daughter at 48, you know, you don't want to be the alcohol police. So you're trying to, again, give her the benefit of the doubt. You've been here a few days, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Saturday, she drank alcohol on the plane. She met producers in the office drunk. She requested staff to get her cigarettes. She requested staff accompany her for lunch. She drank alcohol at lunch. On Sunday, she told the staff she had 10 drinks the day before. She told a segment producer she had two shots of tequila and a bottle of wine that morning. Uh, on Monday, she texted the producer at 8 a.m. that she spent her last dollar on alcohol and had been drinking since 2.30 a.m requested the staff take her to the liquor store. She smelled of alcohol and was stumbling around. You're shaking your head no? <clears throat> we have the text. Yeah. You asked the producer for a drink this morning. How many bottles you figure you've got hidden in your parents' house right now, empties? Maybe like 15. And how many have you carried out of there when you had the chance? 20. Let's be completely honest. We're not going to debate if you have a drinking problem, are we? No. And you disclosed to us that you're drinking in their house. That tells me that you don't really want to hide this. No. Let's, let's be completely honest, okay? I mean, what the hell? I mean... They can kill you, but they can't eat you, right? I mean... Yeah. How many bottles you figure you've got hidden in your parents' house right now? Empties? Um, maybe like 15. And how many have you carried out of there when you had the chance? 20. So 15 there, and you've taken 20 out so far? Yeah. How do you not know this? She's sneaking. She stays in her bedroom with the door shut. I can't help her if you don't help me. Okay. That's the problem here. I, well, I can't. Well, we will help you. And, and listen, you got to be just worn the hell out. I mean, cash-wise, otherwise, I, and I, I don't know. You, you may not put him up for husband of the year or whatever, but I'll tell you what. The boy has stepped up here. He's taken care of your children. Yeah. He's he's bent his life around. He's he's uh, uh, God bless you. Uh, I, I, I I've been doing this a long time. 
a lot of folks would have been gone a hell of a lot before now. Um, and he still obviously cares about the mother of his children. And he's not trashing you to the children. I can see that from what your daughter is saying. But you know you have a daughter with a chronic alcoholic problem, right? Yes. Y you know you've got a chronic, chronic alcoholic that has relapsed 10, 15, 20 times. Yeah, here's the keys. Here's the keys. Run an errand. Take the car. Oh, and here's some cash. Here's some cash and the car keys. Go forth. That had that has to you have to get in the car and shake your head. Don't you sometimes wonder how did I get away with this? Mm -hmm. They gave me money and a car. Don't you back out sometimes thinking how it's did terrifying. I pull this off? It's terrifying. I don't I don't feel good about it. It's it's something that is ruining my life and it's a compulsion. Yeah. But don't you wonder how did I how did this how did I get away with this? I got a car and money. I, I can go out and Long Island iced tea. I, I I can I can go out and drink. Yeah. So, what is best for Steve and Carrie's children? I mean, Steve's older sister, Beth, is here. She has a surprising take on all of this. We'll hear from her next. Um, we're trying to unravel this. We'll be right back. Before I became a mother, I used to look at Carrie and think, I want to be a mom just like her. She was so wonderful. And now I look at her and I can't believe the difference. Once Carrie starts drinking, the parenting stops. The last couple of years, Carrie has almost entirely abandoned her children. My concern is for those children. They deserve a great life. My children are absolutely everything to me. I'm very close to them, and we spend great weekends together at my parents' house. What I provide for my children is a strong mother figure. I do all the physical things. I wake them up in the morning. I make them breakfast. I take them to school. I drive them to their after-school activities. I take them to doctors, dentists. I feel I'm a good mom because I'm very attentive to their feelings. I deal with them with gentleness and love. If Steve thinks that I'm not a good mom, he should take a look at himself. Well, Steve says there's no good reason to divorce his estranged wife, Carrie, because it wouldn't make sense financially. It wouldn't help their children. However, his older sister, Beth, says motherhood may just be too stressful for Carrie to handle. My brother, Steve and Carrie, had a wonderful life. They were in New York and they had it all. Before I became a mother, I used to look at Carrie and think, I want to be a mom just like her. She was so wonderful. And now I look at her and I can't believe the difference. When everything came crashing down, the children were stuck right in the middle of this. Once Carrie starts drinking, the parenting stops. There were many times where the kids knew better than to get in the car with Carrie. They would walk home from school. Stephen has done everything for these children. The last couple of years, Carrie has almost entirely abandoned her children. I really worry about my brother, Stephen. Stephen is very stressed having to do all the cooking, the cleaning, both parenting. My concern is for those children. They deserve a great life. These children need a stable home. These kids need dependable parents. Well, Beth, thank you for being here. What can you add to this conversation? Well, everybody's been very kind. I'm not going to be as kind, unfortunately, because um, these kids are suffering. You haven't been there, and when you are there, you're in your room. You haven't cooked a meal. You haven't gone to one of their events. She didn't even want to go to dance anymore because she was embarrassed that she was the only one that's mother didn't come to the, her dance recitals or her talent show. And Steven's doing the best he can. And I know you think you've been there, but Carrie, you just haven't been there in years. I know, I think your disease tells you one thing, but the truth of the matter is, you've abandoned these children and they are wonderful in spite of you and not because of you. 
Those children deserve more. You are so lucky to have them, and you don't deserve them. You don't deserve them until you get better. And my brother, God love him, has done everything. He might not be perfect, but my God, he's been there for them. And you haven't. You're, you're saying, what is what? And, you know, what do you, what do you say to what she's saying? It's not the way I want to live, and it's not the way I want to be a parent. You know that in me is this longing to be present in their lives. Don't say I've been a great parent. Don't let me hear you say, I've been a great parent, I've been there, I go to her. In kindergarten, she's in seventh grade. Do you know what size bra she wears? Do you know what boy she likes? She couldn't come to you. She called me for those things that she needed a female. She adores you. She didn't want to ever hurt you. I'd say, why don't you ask your mom? Oh, it's going to be too much. I don't want to send her over the edge. I don't want to make her anxious or make her depressed. So can you help me with this? It's not been easy. I ask you where you think this is going to wind up if you keep making the choices that you're making. And um, I, I ask a, a good friend of mine, uh, Ann Margaret, to come here um, today. Uh, Ann Margaret Carroza is an attorney. She's an asset protection attorney. She's the author of the book Love and Money, Protecting Yourself from Angry Exes, Wacky Relatives, Con Artists, and Inner Demons. Uh, which is available in bookstores, by the way. And, uh, and Margaret and I have worked together a lot. And there, there gets to a point where everybody has to be a fiduciary for the children. Everybody has to make the right decisions. And we're at a point here that people need to start thinking about what's the best and right thing to do, correct? Absolutely. In the book, I talk about strategies that we as women can undertake to regain control over our financial lives. In your position, I would sell uh, the red bottom shoes, I would sell some of those designer clothes, uh, generate some cash, open up a savings account, uh, give your parents some money toward utilities, you're going to start to feel more in control. Yes, it's a tiny thing, but you know how when they say when money's a problem, everything's a problem? When you have control over your money, you start to feel a little bit stronger and maybe better able to tackle the other areas of your life. Uh, but it, as far as the kids go, uh, I think it's critically important that Carrie and Steve within your estate planning documents, uh, you need to memorialize the arrangement that you have with Beth that if something happens to you, uh, that Beth could step in as a legal guardian. Uh, otherwise, she'd be in court and it could be a three-ring circus. The other thing that I'd want to see you all do is to the extent that, Beth, you have the kids for extended blocks of time, uh, Carrie and Steve should each execute what's called designation of standby guardian. It's a downloadable form. You don't have to pay an attorney to do it. But this way, Beth, if there's a medical emergency, you're legally empowered to deal with it. Yeah, the last thing we want to do right now, I mean, everything's about timing, right? The last thing you want to do right now is make funds available to you if your disease is in control of your life. But what you're saying is, there is a point where you do want to do everything you can to make people whole, to feel like you're contributing, to feel like you're making uh, some type of contribution, and that is true. But you've got to get yourself under control before you're able to do any of that. Now, Carrie's family came here to find out how she can start focusing on her future, not live in the past. So. I'm curious how she feels about all of this, and I'm going to tell you what I think needs to happen going forward. It, it's going to really surprise you. We'll be right back.
When I look at those old pictures of myself, I just ask myself why. I just wonder where did things go wrong and how do we get her back to where she needs to be? My fear is that I may lose my children and end up on the street. It's a possible future for me. My hope for Carrie is that this will be her light bulb moment, that she finally finds the strength and get her life on track. I, I do think you can turn this around. And I, I have some thoughts about this. I, I asked some people to come here today. Uh, in the audience is Dr. Maureen Esposito, the executive uh, vice president of clinical services, and uh, Dr. Jawad, the medical director of Transformations Treatment Center. It is a premier treatment center which specializes in drug and alcohol and therapy and support. It's a dual diagnosis treatment center. But I'm not sending you there. I think it's important to have that asset and under the right circumstances, um, they have agreed to accept you into the program, correct? Correct. And uh, y'all realize she's been in and out of rehab and failed a number of times, correct? Exactly. And anybody can be a star in rehab, right? The problem is transformation yeah. to the outside. Yeah. It's that transition yeah. to the outside world. And I've made that a pet project of mine. And you all know what virtual reality is, right? When you put on goggles and wherever you look, you feel like you are right there in the moment. Here's an example. If you feel like you're actually in a race car driving, well, take a look at this and you'll see what I'm talking about. Well, I've done the same thing for the treatment world. I've created a virtual reality tool to help that transition go smoothly and prepare for triggers. Here I am in a bar. Why? Uh, because I know that people are going to get in high-risk situations once they get out. And I want to be there in a patient's head training folks on how to handle those high-risk situations. It offers a unique experience so patients can sit down in a face-to-face -face setting with me without ever leaving the safety of the facility. Certain elite rehab programs across the country have this tool as part of their protocol, including Transformations Treatment Center. And so the idea that I'm going for here is when someone like you goes into treatment and gets out, I want there to be a significant voice in your head, a significant voice in your head that stands out from all the noise where you can say, okay, this is what Dr. Phil and I talked about. I see this in my head. We stood in a bar together and we, we talked about this and it registers in my head and it becomes a trigger for coping instead of a trigger for meltdown. Because I know people can be stars in rehab, it's transitioning out and I'm trying to create a virtual reality tool to help people do that. And it's working really, really well. And let me tell you why I'm not wanting you to go home with these people. Because you've done this time and time again, and you have failed. So why do the same thing over again? You are going to earn your way into this elite program. And here's how it's going to work. You guys are going to have to become part of this program. If you guys continue to do what you do, it won't matter what I do. Here's how this is going to work if you're going to take my... You want my help? I do. Number one, there has to be total transparency. Total transparency. You have to have permission. Give yourself permission. She gives you permission. Total transparency. Don't kick her out today. She didn't follow your rules. You didn't enforce your rules. Both of you failed in that regard. Total transparency. You, you don't drink in their house. Go home, get rid of all those bottles. You have to submit to random drug and alcohol tests. Buy them anytime. They are going to be my surrogates as alcohol and drug police until further advice, okay? 
I'm going to get you a personal trainer, I'm going to get you a life coach, and I'm going to get you a therapist. And you are going to get real, real busy taking pride in yourself again, and you're going to roll out of bed at 8 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to be on a track at 8.30 somewhere, and you're going to be working out with a personal trainer. probably twice a day and you're going to see a therapist on a regular basis and you're going to be drug and alcohol tested and if you do what I want you to do for 30 days then you will go with these people awesome okay awesome, awesome. thank you you can do this all right okay all right makes sense okay all right, to find out more about this virtual reality program I'm talking about and where it's offered, you can go to drphil.rehab uh, and you'll have information there. I want to thank all of my guests today, especially Ann Margaret Carroza and especially my friends at Transformations Treatment Center, the Executive Vice President of Clinical Services, Dr. Maureen Esposito, and Medical Director, Dr. Jawad. Thank you for being here. I can't tell you how much you've helped. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.